Hello everyone, my name is Merlin, and together with my colleague Delio, we are going to present our work on Mitsuba 2, which is a retargetable forward and inverse renderer. This is joint work with Tizian Zeltner and Vanso Jakob. This project started with the observation that physically based rendering systems are faced with increasingly complex requirements. For instance, in an accurate simulation, we may need to account for the spectral properties of light, or even its polarization. At the same time, we'd like to run our rendering algorithms efficiently, for example, by taking advantage of the vector instructions on modern CPUs. Finally, we may want to solve challenging inverse problems using differentiable rendering. Adding any of these features to an existing rendering system would typically involve a complete redesign. In fact, people have been building individual systems to support each of these features, sometimes spending years of engineering efforts. With Mitsuba 2, we present an architecture which is able to support all of these and more. In this talk, we introduce the retargetable architecture, which allows us to support a wide range of complex features in a single unified code base. In particular, Mitsuba 2 supports differentiable rendering with full global illumination. As you will see, it's written in modern C++ and we leverage the type system to do most of the heavy lifting. The first part of this talk will be quite technical with details about Mitsuba 2's architecture and implementation. In the second part, Delio will present some cool applications that were enabled by this system. When designing this system, we had a few goals and requirements in mind. Despite supporting multiple features and targets, we want to have as little code duplication as possible. Likewise, we don't want to sacrifice performance for this generality. Mitsuba 2 is a platform for research, so we want it to be modular and easy to extend. This turns out to be one of the most challenging aspects of the project. As I've hinted at before, there are existing systems that have been built to support one or more of the features we are interested in. First, ISPC is a compiler built at Intel, which allows to automatically vectorize code. Writing a compiler is certainly a good way to approach this problem, but we find it challenging to maintain a compiler without support of a dedicated team. TensorMath libraries such as TensorFlow and PyTorch support CPU and GPU targets, as well as automatic differentiation. But they are not designed for the type of unstructured computation with low arithmetic density that we have to perform in rendering. Moreover, there is no support for virtual function calls. Finally, Redner, created by Tsuma Oli and colleagues, is able to run differentiable rendering with great performance on the GPU. However, it relies on manual derivatives. Differentiating rendering algorithms by hand turns out to be very difficult, and that makes this approach challenging to extend. All right, so let's start with Mitsuba 2's architecture. In a sense, Mitsuba 2 is a generic renderer, which is parameterized by two types one to represent floating point quantities, and the other to represent colors. By changing these underlying float and spectrum types, we are then able to retarget the entire renderer. The second important ingredient is Enoki, which is a new tensor math library. It offers a collection of array types, which encapsulate all of the target-specific details. Enoki provides an array type for each target, such as vectorized CPU or CUDA. They all conform to the same interface, so they can be manipulated interchangeably. These types can be composed by nesting them, and this is, for example, how we achieve automatic differentiation on the GPU, as we'll see later. All the important operations are available, like math operations, reductions, masking, and so on. There is also support for virtual function calls on pointer arrays, which is essential, for example, when different materials are intersected in a wavefront path tracer. So all of the platform-specific details live in Enoki. For example, the intrinsics that you need to write vectorized operations. And this enables us to write much cleaner code in the renderer itself. Now we are going to look into more details on the side of the renderer. Based on the float and spectrum type parameters, which will be Enoki arrays, we derive all of the necessary related types, data structures, and algorithms to build a complete physically-based renderer. For instance, rays will be manipulated by many parts of the renderer, so we declare a ray data structure, but template it over the float and spectrum types. From these two types, we compute all related types like 3D vectors, points, etc. And then declare the structures fields as usual. If we set the float parameter to be a plain scalar float, this code generates a data structure with one float for the time property, one float for the x direction, the y direction, and so on. 
But if we swap in an Enoki array type like packets, this generates a wide or wavefront version of the data structure, with for example 16 floats for time, 16 floats for x direction, and so on. This automatically results in a structure of arrays layout, which is appropriate for vectorized computations. An important thing to note is that all of these transformations are performed at compile time, which means that we don't pay a runtime cost for this generality. And so once all of the important data structures are defined, we are able to write rendering algorithms, BSDFs, emitters, and so on, all still being parameterized by the float and spectrum types. When implementing plugins, the correct derived types are automatically imported, which means that the resulting code is almost identical to standard C++ code. Except that with that single implementation, we can target spectral rendering, vectorized rendering, differentiable rendering, and so on. There is one major difference though, which is that we need to replace most conditionals with select statements and masking. Here is the reason why. Because the renderer can now be made wide, we manipulate arrays of many rays at once, potentially millions of them. So we need a way to keep track of which rays participate in which computation. For example, the red ray here is shadowed by the table, so it shouldn't receive light from this emitter. To achieve this, we must maintain a mask or array of booleans which keeps track of which lane is active. Here, a compiler like ISPC has an advantage because it can automatically rewrite if statements to masked operations. So far, we've seen how the entire renderer is lifted over the float and spectrum types, which allows us to retarget it to different applications. Before concluding this part of the presentation, I would like to give a bit more details about how we achieve differentiable rendering on the GPU. Differentiable rendering is typically used as part of an optimization loop, where we are trying to recover unknown scene parameters. We start from an initial guess and create an image using a differentiable renderer. We then compare that current result to a reference image using a loss function and backpropagate through the simulation to compute gradients of the loss with respect to the scene parameters. Finally, we apply a gradient descent step to update the scene parameters after repeating this process several times, we hopefully converge to the desired parameters. This is essentially the same thing as training a neural network. But the big question is, how to differentiate through a whole light transport simulation? To achieve this, Enoki offers two array types, which we combine to obtain differentiable rendering on the GPU. First, let's look at the CUDA backend. By setting the float type to be Enoki's CUDA array type, we allow that backend to intercept all operations and translate them on the fly to GPU code. So essentially, the CUDA backend implements a just-in-time compiler from the source C++ code to PTX, which is a sort of assembly language for CUDA kernels. These operations keep being accumulated until a synchronization point is encountered. Then the kernel is assembled and executed on the GPU. Inside of the kernel, all of the intermediate results can be stored in registers instead of memory, which really helps with performance. Note that with this approach, we automatically get kernel fusion. The compiled kernels are cached, so in the end, the compilation time is really negligible. Finally, Enoki defines an autodiv backend, which performs reverse mode automatic differentiation. In this example, we have defined the float type to be an Enoki autodiv array. We indicate that we want to compute gradients for some of the inputs, such as this variable a. So what happens now is that for any computation involving that input, the autodiv backend will also maintain a representation of the computation graph, which enables us to backpropagate through the entire computation. Now, because the autodiv array type is composed over the CUDA array type by nesting, all of the graph operations for autodiv are themselves being translated to PTX by the CUDA backend. So the forward computation and graph construction are being merged together into the same kernel. This creates nice opportunities for automatically reusing parts of the computation that are shared between the forward and backward passes. In practice, of course, the computation graph becomes extremely large for the kind of simulations that we are interested in running, actually much larger than is shown here, and the kernels that JIT compiler generates can be hundreds of thousands of lines long. We periodically simplify this graph to keep memory usage in check. I will now hand over to Delio, who will present several applications that show what's possible with this system. Thanks, Merlin. 
In the first application, we used the polarization support to simulate an optical experiment. In the second application, we used the vectorized backend and present a new coherent rendering method. The last two applications both make use of differentiable rendering to solve complex inverse problems. By supporting polarization and spectral rendering, we are able to use Mitsuba 2 for predictive rendering applications. In this scene, we simulate a simple optical experiment. Light from a red laser goes through two polarization filters and a dielectric object in between. As we rotate the polarizer in the front, the directly visible laser light gets blocked. The remaining laser light we see is elliptically polarized due to refraction. While this experiment is very simple, we believe having a spectral and polarized renderer can be very useful to prototype and validate optical experiments. Now let's have a look at an example application where we use Mitsuba 2's vectorized rendering capabilities. Standard path tracing evaluates light paths in a highly incoherent manner. Using vectorized instructions does not result in a large performance gain since the scene traversal is so incoherent. In our paper, we introduced a novel coherent primary sample space metropolis light transport algorithm. This algorithm evaluates a coherent bundle of rays while still resulting in an unbiased estimate of the true image. Using this coherent algorithm, we can get improved convergence compared to standard, non-vectorized PSSMLT. At equal time, the root mean square error is reduced by 30 to 40 percent. Here is another example of a scene with many complex glossy interactions, where we achieve a similar reduction in error. You can find a lot more detailed statistics related to errors and performance in our paper. Now let's have a look at our differentiable rendering applications. As mentioned before, we can use a differentiable renderer inside a gradient descent loop to solve inverse problems. We only need to implement a suitable differentiable forward rendering method and define an appropriate loss function. One application of differentiable rendering is caustic design. The problem in caustic design is to optimize a surface to produce a certain caustic when illuminated by a light source. In our setup, here illustrated on the right, we optimize the displacement of the back surface of this transparent slab to produce the target caustic. The problem of caustic design has been addressed in several previous papers. Previous solutions used for example optimal transport theory or decomposition of the caustic into Gaussian kernels. While these approaches work well, the math they use is fairly complex and hard to extend. Using Mitsuba 2, we only need to implement a simple forward rendering method to render caustics. We can then optimize the surface by using our autodiff backend and performing gradient descent. In this example, we optimize our geometry to produce a caustic reproducing this image on the left. The optimization starts at the coarse resolution and then gradually refines the image until we get a very good match. Gradually increasing the resolution of the optimized displacement map allows to avoid getting stuck in local minima. Here you can see the result of this optimization, re-rendered with light arriving from different angles. This framework can also naturally handle colored light sources. Using a grid of colored light sources, we can optimize our surface to reproduce this painting on the right. The optimized geometry mixes the primary colors in the correct proportions to produce the colors of the painting. Note that the region outside of the image is not part of the optimization and that the stray light is not penalized. Differentiable rendering is a very flexible tool and can be used to tackle novel problems. In this example, we optimize a lens with continuously changing index of refraction, which means rays inside propagate along curved trajectories. These types of optics are also called gradient index optics. We optimize the IOR to reproduce two different caustics from a single lens. Here is the result of such an optimization. Using Mitsuba 2, we again only had to implement a simple forward rendering method, which then allows to optimize the IOR values using gradient descent. It's important to note that previous caustic design methods are not able to handle this setting and are most likely very difficult to extend to it. The result here still gradually gets sharper until we arrived at the converged results. Another application of differentiable rendering is to reconstruct volume densities. Given images of a volume, for example a smoke plume, we would like to reconstruct the underlying 3D density field. In contrast to a standard tomographic reconstruction, we reconstruct the density while accounting for multiple scattering inside of the volume. In this example, we optimize a density grid to match the appearance captured from nine reference views. This is a synthetic example where the reference views have been rendered. Constructing a practical capture setup using real smoke was beyond the scope of this paper. The gradient descent optimization manages to reproduce the complex 3D structure of the smoke plume. As in previous examples, we used a coarse to fine optimization to avoid local minima. The last example I would like to show is motivated by fabrication. 
Given a 3D printer, which prints inks of different colors, we would like to reproduce a certain surface texture. The problem is now that the material printed by the 3D printer is translucent, which leads to subsurface scattering and reduces the contrast, as you can see in the example on the left. Our goal is now to optimize the 3D colors of the printed object to compensate for the subsurface scattering and preserve the texture contrast. In this optimization, we simulate up to 64 bounces inside of the object. In this example here, we aim to reproduce the appearance of this textured slab. We would like to reproduce this reference appearance using a slightly translucent printer material. If we naively assign color values to the voxels of this object, we lose a lot of detail due to the translucency of the material. After optimizing for the color values, we get a much more faithful reproduction of the original appearance. We can also slice through this slab to see how the optimized color varies in depth. The variation in depth is needed to compensate for the translucency of the material. The naive voxel colors on the left do not consider the depth inside of the object. In all these optimizations, we used our CUDA Autodiff backend. We optimize for up to 12 million parameters at the same time. Each gradient descent step takes from a couple of seconds up to around three minutes. Depending on the application and its convergence properties, we run around 200 to 1500 gradient descent steps. This results in overall optimization times from around half an hour to up to 12 hours. These timings were all measured on a single NVIDIA RTX Titan GPU. For all these applications, there's probably still some room to further tweak hyperparameters to reduce the optimization time. The optimization performance is similar to Redner, despite Redner using handwritten derivative code. Mitsuba 2 uses automatic differentiation, which makes it much more flexible. While we believe that Mitsuba 2 is going to be very useful for a lot of different applications, there are a few limitations. Having to convert if statements to masks can be challenging for new developers. Further, our JIT compilation approach does not result in the fastest possible GPU renderer due to the large number of kernel launches. State-of-the-art GPU renderers often use a so-called megakernel approach where more computation is grouped into a single GPU kernel. Finally, when using automatic differentiation, we are often limited by the available memory on the GPU. In conclusion, we presented a retargetable rendering architecture which supports a large range of complex features in one single framework. We support spectral, polarized, vectorized and differentiable rendering all in the same code base. We evaluated our system on a range of non-trivial applications. With these applications, we only scratched the surface of what we believe to be possible. It could for example be interesting to combine the polarization support with inverse rendering. This could be useful to reconstruct real scenes observed using different polarization filters. We would like to thank the large group of people who contributed to this project in various ways over the course of its development. Thank you for your attention.